Yeah, it, it came to my father in uh, 1953 when his father died. And uh, the question was at that point, what were my parents going to really do with it? Um, it was a ramshackle dairy running its own, sort of paying its own bills. Three or four people, uh, three or four families uh, lived here and, and ran it. And the, and the so-called big house up there was just wide open, left all of its sort of portraits on the wall and its, its sort of antiques on the on, deteriorating away. And so the question is, uh, what are we going to do with that? And my mother really, more than my father, said, well, if we're going to own it, we're going to have to populate it. So we started coming down. I was born in 1946, and I have two older brothers and then one r r much younger brother. But we started coming down maybe when I was four or five for the summer. And at that point, there was no uh, electricity. There was barely any plumbing in, in the house. My mother cooked in another little house next to it, which did, was the only building on the property that had electricity in the early 50s. And uh, so, so we lived this, this life of, of kind of moles in, in this decaying uh, sort of mansion. And, and I've described in a scene in my, the first book about this place that I published, Mason's Retreat, in 1996, describe a family arriving there uh, in that case from England, but really what I was talking about was what it felt like every June when we opened up the door. And we just uh, lived in a way that, uh, that I never let my three sons live, which is completely uh, on our own. We were out on the water. We couldn't swim because most kids that grew up around here then, there were no pools around, just jellyfish. Or we would come down here, the farm, and follow the guys around uh, and sort of show up at, at, at mealtimes. Uh, it was a long way from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I, where I grew up and the very proper little private schools I went to. Yeah, that's a, a great question, a fun question for me. Um, really, it started with uh, my grandfather, my father's father, a person I only met two or three times. He lived in Bermuda at the end of his life. And, we went down and visited a couple of times, but he'd become a British subject by then. And um, he was this loud, uh, kind of obnoxious, disagreeable guy, I have this sort of vague memory. And so this character, uh, Edward Mason, is the sort of the titular character. And he, he appears and I mean, keeps reappearing either in person or in memory in the four books was this sort of brash fool, but he was kind of, but, but he was my fool, and I liked him. He was funny, he was funny to write. I always fell into an ironic tone uh, with him, and uh, had great fun with him. But then I began to think, well, what kind of a, of a wife would sort of put up with this guy, and then what kind of kids would come? So here was this family of a, Edith, his wife, who, who uh, I mean, the story is long about her, but still she sort of goes along because she's got no particular choice. And then there are two sons, one of, one of whom hates his father and the other who loves him. So this is rather biblical in a way. But that, that, then it widened into sort of not real people, but types that I knew down here that are populating the farm. And it became a story, as all of the books are, of in black and white. So th there were the, uh, you know, the, the white owners and the black workers. That's the, way it, that's the way it was. And so there's a lot in Mason's retreat of, of trying to imagine the, um, you know, the black population here. Um, it is easy to let it rest. I, I never intended it. I never intended, after I finished one, to write the next. Uh, and, and often there were a couple of books in between. Uh, and when I published Mason's Retreat in, in 96, I thought that was, that was plenty. But the, the, the fact was I, my editor had wanted me to take out some stuff. It was a little overstuffed, so there was some material. And then I'd begun to learn some things uh, around here. The, the book got people asking me questions, people I didn't know, or just saying, by the way, you know, that thing you mentioned, you know, I know where that was, and stuff like that. So I, I got some new material, and so then, the, from about 
2007 to 2012, I, I worked on the right hand shore and published that. And then I figured I was done, but I had sent this interracial couple, this is an old family story, a uh, real story, um, off to France. The interracial couple in my family's case ended with a suicide. They didn't get to go to France and live. But So I had sent them off to escape to France in 1892. So then I thought, well, gee, uh, I, I wonder how it goes for them. Uh, in France, and so then I then I wrote Thomas and Beale in the Midi, uh, and then this last one was okay. At this point, uh, my editor and I was saying, you know, I do want to conclude this. I want to talk about the meanings of history. I want to talk about the meanings of historical fiction, and I just want to talk about a family that that without any huge pretensions just happens to live in this. Uh, peculiar relationship to history and what do they think of it? That's, so that's how, that's where I end. I end with the fact they don't know what to think of it. It's uh, Henry James, I'm a great fan of Henry James, I'm one of the few these days, um, but uh, has a wonderful preface when he, when he talks about that, as I was saying to you just a moment ago, that idea of, okay, I've got the kernel, I put my hands over my ears so I can't hear anything more, and he describes that, hearing a story at, at, a, at a dinner party and then saying, and, and he, from there on, he had to, it became the colonel. Uh, so so that, that seems, to be, seems to be that sense of you find narrative in a tiny event and without even thinking everyone does this, they kind of create a beginning, middle, and an end. I think that's the way, I think cognitive scientists would tell us that's kind of the way we make sense of the world. So you hear this tiny little incident, a, a, a guy does X, and, and you're already imagining, even without knowing it, the, what led up to it and what, what follows upon it. Will you miss teaching? I, I, I miss the students. Uh, I miss uh, the undergraduates just because they had my heart, each and every one. And the graduate students, uh, I taught in a... Uh, Master Fine Arts program, a, a, a quite good one, and th these were very accomplished uh, people. They live in a in a publishing world and in a literary world that I d that I'm not in at all, and so I I towards the end was encouraging them and having a great time, but feeling that I just wasn't very useful. I mean, even from the simplest point of, you know, hey, what's the name of a, few, of a few agents I could talk to? And I don't know them anymore. I have one agent, and that's all I know. And so this oh, just, this just uh, I'm not quite sure where popular literary fiction, where, where it's particularly going now, whether it's more into, into various forms of Nonfiction novels, auto fiction, uh, sort of fictionalized memoir, or whatever, all those hybrid forms. And uh, it, it, it tends to, in my mind, close the writer in to say, well, I can't talk about that. And, and I'm so old fashioned and, and, and not, in some quarters, not particularly loved for the fact that, that, that I feel, well, if I've got a character that's that's so unlike me, I still have to give her the sort of honor of making her real and give give her a consciousness. So if this is a black farm girl living in the 1870s, I'm a fiction writer. That's what I do. I, I just sort of occupy her and try to bring her forth, and that's just not very fashionable these days. And uh, one one. One thing that interests me is there is a, a, a formerly black, formerly free black community that's just down the road here uh, that features a lot in, in my books. And in fact, in the Tobacco, uh, I always say Tobacco Road, it's my own title and I can never get it right, Tobacco Coast, uh, involves a, a sort of a tour for reasons of it. But it but it, the, the, it's gone. I mean, most of it is just one of the houses and there's a collection of or trailers and this and that down there, but it was a very, very rich community in the in the 50s, and and it had a sort of a pre-war free black history 
as well. It, it, it was a it was a, a, a thriving. I used the word the other day in something I published called a, a robust free black population. And a guy took me to task and said, "Hey, wait a minute. You know, they, they, they were there, but they were brave little outposts." Well, well, this was one. And 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 then there is this graveyard that I mentioned to you just as we were talking before we began, and um, that that has never been researched. Uh, you go on find a grave, and it's just one that you know the the website knows it's there, but doesn't know who's there. So I I really am becoming interested in doing some work there, at at least trying to contribute something to an effort. Maybe one of the descendants uh, of the people that, that live there, or or maybe push it to fruition. So that that's one thing I'm. Thinking about, I, and I, I'm, and I've been working on some short stories, uh, really using material about growing up around Boston. In other words, far from here, yeah. and and those have been fun. But you know, at this point, I I still have the desire. I don't feel the urgency. If a day goes by when I've written not a word, I don't sort of beat myself up as I'm brushing my teeth. I I say, oh well, I'll do some tomorrow. 